Alright, hello every everybody. Uh, I would like to welcome you to my talk about simplifying persistence and together we can explore Spring Data Eclipse Store for your Spring application. Um, my name is Johannes and we'll uh, first get into Eclipse Store itself, how it works, what it does. Then we'll get to our Spring Data integration. We'll talk a, uh, a little bit about that and then we'll get into live coding. Um, this uh, QR code that you see is for Slido. I think by now you're used to it. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. My name is Johannes Rabber. I'm, uh, I studied um, at the Hof University of Applied Sciences. I'm a Bachelor of Science in Informatics. I worked at the atomic power plant, at a radar station at the Bundeswehr and at the Institute for Information Systems, which is unfortunately named ISIS. Uh, <laughs> now, now I work at XDEF and I do custom software for customers. I'm also an open source contributor and that's my GitHub link, but links will be at the end anyway. So. Let's get started. When I started programming as a hobby, persistence was defined by SQL. If you had to persist anything, you would use SQL. We see here a small SQL statement, a select, which is pretty easy to read, I think, and it's very simple. Not very nice, but simple. When I uh, started studying for my bachelor's, I was confronted with JPA. And queries there looked like this, which meant, well, it was type safe and it was Java, so that was cool. But um, effectively, you had to learn two new languages, which is the, the querying language, the criteria query, in JPA and SQL because eventually if you work with JPA you have to find out what SQL statements are created. But in Java we use object graphs, right? And we have objects with relationships. We don't have tables, or at least not only tables. So you needed mapping. You still need mapping. And there are two choices which you have. So the first one is the, the manual formatting and parsing of SQL statements, which actually nobody does really. And the second way to do it in Java is um, automatic mapping between table and object structure, which goes by JPA, where JPA does the heavy lifting for you and you simply have to build the entities. This is pretty simplified, but in essence, that was the issue for me. Then I came across MicroStream, which is now called Eclipse Store because they joined the Eclipse Foundation. Eclipse Store serializes any object graph and it stores it to the, to, to the hard drive, at least as default. So why wouldn't I just use uh, Google's JSON or Jackson? Well, f at first, uh, uh, f as first point, it's fast. They implemented their own serializer, which does some magic in memory, and it's really quite fast. The second point is uh, you can update, uh, you can update, sorry, any parts of the graph, so you don't have to serialize or deserialize the complete object. You just update whatever you changed or whatever you removed, whatever you want to update. And like I said, the default target is the hard drive, but you can store data at uh, a lot of different targets, which would be AWS S3, AWS Dyn Dynamo DB, SQL DBs, or IBM uh, COS, which is the, the IBM version 
of S3. And it can do lazy loading, um, <coughs> which means lazy references are possible. You don't need to load all your data from your database into memory at once, but you can uh, load all the data you need right now, and then lazily you load the data you need afterwards. So I will give you a minimalistic example of how a microstream is used. For starters, we have this minimalistic uh, root class with a list of product products. And a product is, in this example, just uh, a record with a name. And we also have a lazy reference here, the big object. The big object uh, can represent some byte array or anything like that, or, or images, some data you don't want to have in your memory all the time, but only load it if it's needed. And as you can see, there are no annotations or IDs necessary. To start the storage, we simply create a new instance of the root, and afterwards we start the embedded storage by giving it the root object. What that does is it checks the storage if there is already a root on your, in, in your storage, in your files. If there isn't, it just stores this new root object. And if there is already a root object, it fills this object with the existing data. Pretty simple, really. And in this example, we get the products of the root object, we add a new product called chair, and then we store it. We'll come back to that line later. And afterwards, we shove it down. All right. <coughs> uh, yeah, so the lazy object is just for show, just to show you how lazy objects are used here. Now, the differences. Eclipse Store is much closer to Java because you don't need any other programming language, right? It's all in pure Java. And <coughs> you can also, like I said, define targets like the hard drive, SQL, DBs, um, or cloud storages. Java streaming, filtering, and mapping like native Java is also possible, so you don't need any criteria query or SQL. And there are no restrictions like um, implementing the serializable interface, IDs or annotations. Annotations may be like uh, one-to-many relationships or many-to-many. -many. You don't need all of that because it's just an object graph. But we come to the acceptance of Eclipse Store. In any training any developer gets, persistence is mostly displayed as SQL, table structure, right? It's always like that. And developers are basically conditioned to think in a table structure because that's most popular. And that's not wrong, of course, because most of the world works like that. Most of the persistence as well. But Eclipse Store does not. So developers need to adjust their thinking from structure, uh, structured um, uh, nah, tables, table structures to object-oriented structure. So in this, this example, um, we want to update object D. And most people would say, well, we want to, to update this object, so we store this object to, to update D. But in Eclipse Store, you actually need to store D. As we can see in this example from uh, previously, um, <coughs> you call the store method and give it not the new product 
chair, but the list of products, because that's actually what changed. And that's a bit counterintuitive for a lot of developers. And in this simple example, it doesn't look like a lot, but actually if you have more com complex data, it gets more complicated. <coughs> so there is this gap between table-oriented thinking and object-oriented thinking. So developers think object-oriented while programming and uh, table-structured while storing. That's when we found as XDEV that there was some opportunity for us. That we can get the benefits of App Eclipse Store <coughs> and no downside of rethinking storage. That's why I want to show you XDEV Spring Data Eclipse Store, or as I will call it SDES, because Spring Data Eclipse Store is quite a lot. <coughs> All right, so a little bit about what's Spring Data. It's first of all a framework to hide complexity of data persistence. It's available for many different systems like JPA, MongoDB or Redis. And it provides a repository structure to abstract object mapping. Repositories let you store and query data. And you only need to create interfaces. So in this example, we have a list CRUD repository, which lets you, without implementing the interface, store a list of users or find a list of users. And Spring injects uh, the S simple user repository in this case, so you can use it. You can also create custom queries by using specific naming patterns. In this example, you can find all the users by a defined last name. And as you can see, it's only the interface which is created the implementation of the interface is done by Spring Data but at runtime. The Excel Clips Foundation is currently also working on Jakarta Data 1.0, which brings repositories to Jakarta. But that's not done yet, and I think it will be released next month. Okay, so developers want to you should use our Spring Data Eclipse Store module like any Spring Data module. There shouldn't be a lot of rethinking, a lot of refactoring going on. That's why I want to show you how easy it is to get started with SDES. First of all, you download the Spring Boot project with Maven and Java from start spring io that's the spring initializer project then we add this simple um, dependency into the pom 1.0.6 is the newest version and then we simply add the enable eclipse store store repositories to our spring boot application when we start coding in this example, we create one pet and one owner, which are both very simple records with a list of pets. <coughs> we use this CRUD repository in this case, which is different from the list CRUD repository. And you can't save a whole list of owners in this case, but only single owners. And that's enough for us right now. And then in the demo application file, we simply create a new owner, which is called Stevenix, and we save Stevenix into our owner repository. And when we call find all, <coughs> we, 
we will find one user, uh, one owner, sorry, which is called Stevie Nicks. Pretty easy, I think. The main difference between Eclipse Store and SDES are working copies. Because Spring users are used to have working copies if they query some data out of their repositories. And objects are only temporary copies with the actual data, but still, they are copies of the actual data. And with Eclipse Store, if you get some data, it's always the, the current actual data object that you change. And that's not how Spring Data users would expect a storage to behave. So until you save your working copy, there is no change made in your data model. As you can see here, the Eclipse store loads the data from the actual uh, storage, which can be, like I said, the hard drive S3 or anything like that. It loads it into memory and the user application or the developer works directly on the Java objects. But with SDES, we create always a working copy of the data and the actual user application is working on that. So it does not directly change anything in the, that data, which is pretty cool. But of course, uh, as you can see right now, in memory, we have potentially more copies of the same objects. That's one downside. But we have a lot of benefits from that, actually two. But they're good benefits, I think. So first, the principle of least surprise for Spring Data users. It behaves like Spring Data JPA storage, for example. And the working copies don't influence each other. And also, concurrency handling is easier. So, with default Eclipse Store, if you have two threads changing the same object and then storing it, it could be that thread one is already storing this invoice in the Eclipse Store, while thread two is still changing some things. So it could be that at the end of the both threads, there's a state of invoice which is neither desired by thread 1 nor thread 2. And that would be really unfortunate. Eclipse Store simply says, well, the user has to handle that himself. But we want to make it easier. So with the working copies, if two threads change this separate working copy of invoice, it's still not clear which invoice object is getting stored, right? Because they are working at the same time. But the difference is, it's either the, the stored invoice is either in the state of thread 1, which thread 1 desires, or in the state which thread 2 desires. There's nothing in between, no invalid state like we have in this case here. We also wanted to make it easy to migrate to SDES, of course. The first step was it can coexist with JP, a Spring JPA within one project. And you simply add the steps we already discussed and then add Eclipse Store in front of your repositories. And that already makes it to an Eclipse Store repository. And every repository you don't change to uh, Eclipse Store is still a normal Spring JPA repository. Migrating data works, works with Eclipse Store Data Importer. You can load your entity manager, load all your entities and store them in your new Eclipse Store repositories. And we also offer 
uh, open rewrite migration recipe, which is pretty basic, but we hope in the future we can expand on it. Now, to the downsides of it. As I already said, effectively, we have doubled the memory we need with the working copies, because each find, find all, find by name, whatever you, you, you need, creates a working copy. And you already have your data in memory, but this creates another working copy in memory. But these working copies have a very small lifetime and are cleaned up fast, usually, at least. Now the lazy objects are not usable. But I have a happy announcement. They're usable. Amazing. <laughs> All right, nobody's amazed but me, but still. It's pretty cool that we can have these lazy objects in Spring Data Eclipse Store, and they are really necessary because otherwise you can only have a small database which you can all store in memory, and that's not very likely in the long run. And queries are not usable. So you can use, uh, as I said before, the find by last name or anything like that. You can um, use that naming pattern, and that works. But in Spring Data, there is also this add query annotation where you can uh, use pseudo SQL or JPQL, and that's not available. Right now, we uh, have planned to, to do that, but we didn't yet. And transactions are also not usable, but again, I have good news. They are usable. Ah, amazing. <laughs> And they are usable as declarative, like with a add transactional, or in a programmatic where you use your transaction manager, where you where you get uh, that injected. But startup time can still be slow with gigabytes of data. So ha if you have huge storages, startup time can still take some seconds, and that's not really great because I would like to see Spring Data Eclipse Store in a scale to zero environment where it's really uh, booting up fast and shutting down again if it's not needed anymore. That is possible, but only for small data. Unfortunately, there's not much we as XLIF can do here. But still, for long running tasks, it's really nice. So, how do you save time and money with SDES? First of all, developing time. It's Java native. So your Java programmers already know how to use it. It's object oriented. Also, Java programmers usually know how to prog program object oriented. It has minimal code overhead. Like I said, the annotations or um, needing to implement serializable. And Spring users are already familiar with the concept of repositories. It's also really fast for storing and reading, and it's fast for debugging. So if you debug your database, you don't need to go to any database server or anything to debug but it's all in Java, and you can completely debug it like any other Java program. That means quick test cycles. All right, how to save money? Open source. It's open source, and you there are no hidden costs, no licensing fees, and the best thing, I think, is you can open issues, the chest, pull requests, fork it, customize it, however, you want. And serverless storage is possible. Like I said, WS3, AWS S3 and IBM uh, COS, for example. And you can uh, really you, uh, save a lot of money up to 
like uh, we had some tests where we save 95% of the uh, storage costs because there are no managed SQL servers. There are, th there are no servers that are designed to run all the time, right? The micro, uh, the SDES could only run on demand if you want that. And S3, for example, already lets you include a backup as well in your storage. All right, that was it for my presentation. Uh, you can scan this QR code and then you will get to my repository with the demo and the presentation and all the files you would want about SDES. And then we would get to the live demo. Okay. So I will change the presentation mode. Now we see that. Okay, so how to get started? Um, for the sake of time, I already downloaded the Spring Boot um, initializer application with, like I said, a minimal configuration. So it's just a basic Spring Boot application without any addition. And <coughs> to be sure that I do everything right, I will copy it that uh, I will copy that from my pull request I also included on my talk repository. So first we copy this dependency of Spring Data Eclipse Store and because we want to um, offer some REST API, we also need the Spring Boot Starter Web. We'll put that somewhere in the POM and then here we load the Maven changes. All right. All right. What we also need to do, and that's a bit uncomfortable, but uh, there is no other way right now, because we merge the working copies back with the actual data. We need to open up some. Uh, parts of, of Java uh, with these arguments. Hopefully in the future we can skip that, but there is no other way right now. And to be sure, we also add that. Well, I would add that in the configuration, but I think because I already did that, uh, yeah, it's already in there. So you uh, would need to add that in the configuration for IntelliJ as well. We update that again. Okay. The next thing we do is enable the Eclipse Store repositories in our main class. Here the live demo application. Import the class, yeah. Then we create an owner, which is also just a record to keep it pretty simple. Yeah. The owner, uh, we make a record, but still, to be sure, we copy it. Bam. All right, so we have a first name and a last name of our owner, and we also create an interface for it the owner repository, which extends the list CRUD repository. That means we can store a list of owners in there. Okay. Once again, I'm not that fast of a typer, so that's more, that's faster and more secure. Now we need our owner res resource to be able to uh, provide an API for our application. Okay, so 
what we do here is we create uh, the REST controller, which has the URI, URI owner URL, and we inject this owner repository that we created over here. Like I said before, there's no implementation of the owner repository, right? It will get injected and implemented by Spring Data. And now we only have a post mapping to create a new owner and store it in our repository. And we have a get mapping to find all the owners. Yeah, there's like um, you see here, we don't have any uh, root object like with Eclipse Store if you use it in the native mode, right? You have only your repository and that's basically, that stores a list of your classes. Yeah, and that should be it. Okay, so we can start all of, uh, one second, I have to check if I erased the storage beforehand. Yeah, I did. All right. So we start this. All right, it's running. I will call um, the curl command to get all the current owners and we'll get no owners. All right. So it's an empty list right now. But if we post a new owner called Stevie Nicks in that example, we should store a new user. We get the response of the new user back. And if we get all our owners again, we will find one. Stevie Nicks. We can also add another owner, maybe Mick Fleetwood. Why not? Right, so we get as a response Mick Fleetwood and if we get all our owners again, we find Stevie Nicks and Mick Fleetwood. And we can also check uh, when we restart our Spring application, the sta uh, data should still be there. So it started again. We get our owners again and we find our two owners, Mick Fleetwood and Stevie Nicks. And you can see here, the storage was created, which has about 17 kilobytes right now, but there's not a lot of data in it. All right, so um, that was it, basically. Uh, we're done pretty fast. I will check the questions in a, a slide. And yeah. Right, there are no questions. Does anybody have a question? Yeah. All right, uh, the cloud storage. Um, okay, um, I deactivated Wi Fi. I'm trying. I will reactivate it, let's see what happens. Um, but basically, there is a configuration strategy for um, Eclipse Store, and you just use that for um, SDS as well. Yeah, uh, one second, I will get to this e yeah, Eclipse Store. Here we go. So. Yeah. All right. So there's this get started documentation, and there it is storage targets. What was it? S3, I think you said? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we go to that. All right. So basically, you add these dependencies. And there is a configuration in place like that. 
and then you should be done. You should be good to go. I think also there is a, a test in place. I'm not really sure about it. But it's basically an um, Eclipse storage configuration thing. And that's, uh, you can do that by the Eclipse store properties, or you can also do that by code uh, where you, you need to um, override some configuration. Um, maybe I can show you that later if you give me information and I, I can show you a concrete example of that. Um, there was another question. Can you show the content of the storage? I can show you the content, but it's not, it's, it's binary data. So uh, the only thing you can read is this uh, persistence type dictionary, which basically lists all the classes you have in your storage. So these are all the uh, default Java definitions. And there we have our owner. And it says what, what's um, the content of this class. And then these uh, bytes. So we only have one channel. You can have uh, different m multiple channels and stuff like that. But th that's just binary data. You won't see uh, anything, unfortunately. Yeah, but that's it. Uh, what is the benefit of having two copies of the same object? Yeah, uh, basically, that was the thing I showed with the multiple threads. That's one of the benefits. So you can uh, have multiple threads doing multiple things on uh, separate copies of the same data and they won't influence, influence each other. That's the, the basic benefit of it. Ah, yeah. The, how about primary keys? Um, now there is no ID, so how to search? Well, OK, that's good. Um, so I have this uh, list, which only finds all, right? And there are a couple of things you can do, but um, most easily for most Java developers is you can just use the streaming API, right? So we, we uh, maybe filter for some uh, data. So we have our owner and the owner's um, first name must be uh, equals, of course, with the strings. I don't know, Hans or something, right? And that's how you uh, work with um, IDs. Now, that that's not IDs, no, that's just basic querying, um, mapping, filtering, stuff like that. But you can also add an ID. So, again, in the test um, package of our Spring Data Eclipse Store, there are a few tests wh where you can see how to use an ID as well. So basically, we would uh, need to change that into a class. Right? And then we can also use this ID. Uh, uh, it, I think it doesn't even depend uh, on what you uh, use here because uh, Spring uh, uses both of them. And then you can say, well, a private integer ID or whatever, right? Um, yeah, so we have that. Private. Oh. Yeah, um, and then we create this constructor with the two important things. We can also add the ID here. Ah, yeah, um, sorry. Okay, this one. And we need to only a getter for the ID. Yeah, so there's this par uh, annotation. Um, I think it's called auto uh, generation, anything like that. Now, gener generated, oh, generated value. I'm not sure about that. I think it is that. So where you say, yeah, generation type auto, 
that's it. Yeah, all right. So in this case, well, sorry. We were. Uh, in this case, you don't need to set the ID because it's uh, getting set automatically by the storage. But you can also set it via the constructor if that's what you, you're you looking for. And then I think even... Yeah, let's get first name now. But yeah. I think mm, there's also... if. In this repository, we can find all by ID. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so in the owner repository, you, the second parameter defines uh, what ID this object has, what type of ID it has. And there we defined already the integer. Uh, that's what I do if there is no ID here, because you have to set something there. But in this case, if we have the ID as an integer, it also works, and you can find things by ID like that then, right? IDs, ah, well, heh, sorry. Well then, okay, if you want it like that, take it. Yeah, so that's basically it. Um, all right, how to enable lazy loading is also uh, good part, I think I showed it, but uh, one thing, so if we want to have that first name lazy, for example, uh, how are we in time? Yeah, we're good, very good. All right, so we use this Eclipse Store lazy wrapper for it, but we need to be careful when initializing it. So usually what you do with Eclipse Store is you call this, so what that does is it basically wraps this, <laughs> in this case, a string, which is not uh, really good practice to wrap a string in a lazy reference. But anyway, you wrap this string into a lazy wrapper and then you can um, set it. And if you want to get that first name again, then you call get, which then um, resolves the lazy reference, which, which says it loads the data from the storage into memory. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, but with SDS you shouldn't do it like that, because um, if, if you do it like that, lazy d has no meaning, because we always create working copies, and by creating a working copy, it loads all the data, also it it resolves the lazy references, but we want, don't want that. So we created this Spring Data Eclipse Store lazy, and you can build it like that, which is basically the same with a more bit more more verbose, I think. But it basically does the same thing. But if you create a working copy, it does not load the lazy data. It um, still uh, prevents the storage from loading it, and only if you get, um, on only if you call get on your working copy, then it will load the data from the storage, create a working copy, and then give that to your call. All right, I think I answered that. You mentioned migrating. How to migrate ETL from a SQL? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what at ETL means. Maybe. All right. Um, so, uh, like I said, uh, the the migrator. Mm, don't I don't think we have time to to do all of that, but. <laughs> um, so uh, no no no, one second. The migrating, yeah, migration. So we have this Eclipse Store uh, data importer, right? And what you can do is here, um, maybe oh, at some place in your um, application, 
Mm, one second. I have to check how that's uh, used again. Yeah, the, oh no, no, no. Ah, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I don't use that a lot. So um, we also have examples for that in our test. Um, Maybe also if you give me your information, I will um, send that example to you. I can't do that <laughs> right now. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, uh, next question. Okay, now, now we have a lot. Um, how do I retrieve latest object if there are copies? Um, I'm not, not quite sure what that means. Uh, so like I said in the, the owner resource, we with this find all uh, command, what you get is a list of owners, but these owners are working copies. So every time you call find all or find by name or whatever, you will create another working copy. Um, so uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, oh, sorry. All right, uh, given I use the find all stream filter method to search for a particular object, will it load all the data for that repository from the storage? Yes, yes, if you, if you do that, it will load all the data. You are absolutely right. And that's why you can use this find all by ID, but you can also, um, hopefully I do it right here. Um, you can also say, well, since this is a list crud repository, I want to get a list of owners, but I want to find that um, owner yeah, ah, by this example, first name. And then you give the first uh, string, first name. Okay, and you don't need to do anything more than that, because Spring also in the background by implementation um, implements it and then you can oh no what did I do so repository and you can call that find owners by first name and then you can uh, call all the mix stump stuff like that okay so in this case it does not load all your, your data. It only loads uh, the MIC owners, right? Okay. Does it support optimistic uh, locking with version? I don't think so. Uh, I would have to check, but I don't think so. Can you sh share storages with others? Others being other applications, probably. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, you can share your storages, right? Uh, you can just simply copy the data, uh, whatever you want with that. But uh, one important part of Eclipse Store is you can only use it in one JVM. So one JVM is for one storage. You can't use multiple JVMs uh, referencing the same data, the same storage. That's not possible, and that's not possible with SDS as well. All right, uh, what happens if we in the future add removes fields from owner class? Yeah, that, <laughs> that comes every time. Uh, how migration happens, what happens to the existing data? So there's also um, huge documentation for uh, Eclipse Store, and that's what we use under the hood. So we do that as well. So uh, Eclipse Store has some automatic mapping, legacy type mapping, it's called, where it has some algorithm that looks if you um, simply change the name, like if you change the first name to last name. Now, maybe that's not a good example. If you change name to first name, then it will automatically, by booting up, uh, recognize, all right, this class in the storage 
has this name field, but in the new def definition of the running JVM, it has this new field called, uh, I think we, I said first name, and then it will map it automatically, and you don't have to do anything. But there is a, uh, a bit uh, a big uh, problem if you have more complicated changes because then you uh, yeah okay the, it also has some automatic mapping where it's not sure if that's what you want and then you have to by by starting it accept it uh, it's a bit tricky as well and then yeah there's uh, explicit mapping that's um, a bit bit tricky but you can say all right um, f yeah for example this um, you you moved the class to a different package or whatever and then you can say all right this class was named like that but now it's named like that and this uh, member variable has that name but now it's that and stuff like that but yeah it's it's a um, bit tricky that's true all right, uh, so there are no more questions. We are out of time. And uh, I thank you very much for being here and uh, having so many questions. That's amazing. I'm really happy. Thank you.